a bit less than yesterday, but still quite intense. So that we are trying to get this down in the first 60, min 60 minutes so we can have the, the, the residual time for uh, do some practice exam to uh, measure up website. Okay, so what are we going to touch today? There are two um, main topics. One is descri the, describe the general security and network security feature. And second, one, second they describe the identity, governance, privacy, and compliance feature within uh, Azure. Here are the whole kind of the subtopic that we are going to touch today. We are going through the through the list now. We are going to look into each one of those into uh, the, 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 during the presentation. Um, on top of that, I'm uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, in the team uh, has already uh, been uh, um, moved into the shared doc, shared folder shared in, in Teams the, the whole the previous PowerPoint. So please uh, go back and refer to those PowerPoint for everything that you need uh, to to eventually. Uh, clarify and or uh, if you need to review some some information. Uh, okay, let's go into the security. So the concept of security within it, uh, Azure is pretty much a layer concept. What does it mean? It means that we are looking into the different layer that compose the security uh, and each layer should be independent from the other. What does it mean? If someone gets into the physical security, it should not affect the, the identity and access. If someone gets into the compute, it should not affect uh, the application, should not affect the network, and so on and so forth. So the, the way in which the security has been put together for Azure is actually this, uh, as a multiple layer, layer of protection and, and the, the, the concept of each layer being dependent of each other. We can see in this, uh, um picture how the security is actually the layer of the security is the physical security pretty much is uh, the physical security to the building where the server are located not only to the building but even within the building they have multiple access gates and stuff like that therefore uh the security here is very very important to the point that uh technically we we don't know exactly where those those uh, those uh, data center are of course if you go and dig in the internet maybe you can, can find some uh, some uh, some forum or some some information where the data center are but for sure microsoft does not disclose the location and the addresses second layer of security is what is called single sign on multi factor authentication so identity and access so pretty much you need to once you are you know once you have installed a, a once you have created an account into Azure, you need to authenticate yourself, and that's to do it through through different way. You can do it through a standard user and password. You can be single sign-on federated to your organization. It can be through MFA, which stands for multi-factor authentication. So it's the typical example, for example, that probably are familiar when you interact with your bank, where uh, to log in or to execute a, a payment, you need to receive an SMS on top of putting a username and password. Then within 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 once you are logged in, you need to define the perimeter of your application, and this is done through firewalls, uh, also software, software and hardware, or DDoS, so the, the denial of services, which is uh, pretty, pretty much uh, one of the protections that uh, uh, are put in place by 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 Azure. Again, DDoS and firewall are things that are there by you. If you do an infrastructure as a services, you are responsible to put in place. If you use a platform as a services or a software as a services, those components are already taken care of by uh, Microsoft as well. Once you have defined the perimeter of where are your applications sit and stuff like that, you need to look into the network. And therefore, in the network, as we briefly touched yesterday, you can put together uh, concepts such as uh, virtual private network, uh, you can, you can uh, um, uh, subnet, and so on and so forth. Next layer down is the so are we sure that we are accessing the right we, we VM? Are you sure are we sure that we the VMs, the operation system are up to date? Is there not any security patches that need to be put in place and stuff like that? Next level is the application. So during the application, you need to be sure that the, 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 the right user can access the right application and that the, the application is kind of uh, let's call it bulletproof. Last but not least is the data layer. So uh, pretty much uh, it's, uh, it's the, the deepest la la layer of data, so therefore you need to be sure that, for example, these are encrypted, uh, the, uh, the, data, the, the database are, are, are again, could be encrypted, 
uh, and, and ensure that no, only some specific user or sometimes only system user can access the, the data. You can see that this kind of layer allow you to ensure that before someone get to your data, you need to go through the, all those steps of different security layer. Now, each layer, we need to implement what is called CI, CIA, which stands for Conf Confidentiality, Integrity, Integrity and Availability. And as example here, you can see how you can apply the CIA uh, concept into those different layers. For example, in physical security, confidentiality, it means that he, uh, to access the Azure data center, you need to probably scan your fingerprint or, or, or your, your eye uh, need to be uh, read as well so that they know exactly who is uh, entering the data center. For what in turn, what concerns the identity and access, we can apply, for example, the concept of integrity. And in the case, it means that uh, to access uh, the Azure subscription, you need to be sure that you, your, your, your user is within the Active Directory so that it can be authenticated. Uh, during the uh, on the perimeter, you can see talk about availability, and in the case the, the, the DDoS protection is, is a way that you keep the the uh, the perimeter available. I mean, the DDoS will filter the malicious attempt, uh, as therefore it is not going to overload your servers. Uh, confidentiality at the network layer, or in the case you, you need to be sure that you set up the network rules so that only certain people can do certain things. Or, and I mean by pe pe people is not actually people, is but only central resources can do can perform certain action. And by resources could be an, a person logging in or a server, a, a service that is identified into one of the uh, use, uh, is a user account within within Azure. Compute again, we need to be sure. Uh, for example, applying the concept of availability, we need to be sure that uh, um, uh, all the compute or all the uh, OS are are up, up to date, uh, the old patches are, are, have been applied, there's no security threat on, uh, because you, you, you have forgot to apply la latest uh, patches and stuff like that. Uh, ampli application, we, for example, we ensure, uh, we, we, we ensure integrity through the encryption session, in the case is uh, pretty much are the encrypted protocol that you will apply during the, the transfer of data between uh, application and, and end user or among application. And then the data layer, the integrity is actually guaranteed by ensuring that, for example, the data is encrypted and stuff like that. Uh, now, this is pretty much the concept of, of security, um, where pretty much you, 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 need, you understand the layer of the security and how each layer is actually need to comply with confidentiality, integrity, availability. This, those are just examples. Now, when you go, go into the security connecti connectivity, we need to be sure that the because uh, um, pretty much the cloud services are accessible uh, via, via the, the via internet, we need to ensure that the network or the or, or the overall connectivity is secure. Now, how do we do that? First of all, Azure has a service called Azure DDoS or Distributed Denial of Services, which allow which allow you to pretty much. Uh, setting up this in front of every single access to your application. And uh, therefore, if there is an attacker, which uh, from a DDoS attack, it means that someone is trying to overload your server so that the server is become overloaded and therefore it cannot function anymore. Let's say that you have a website and that uh, typically you are sizing your website for a, a thousand users per day and the DDoS is going to provide to you like uh, a simulating 1 million users per day. The server will not be able to cope, therefore the, the service will be completely shut down. With a, a DDoS Azure services protection, um, uh, Azure will identify those as being malicious, therefore it will filter them down and therefore, and as a result, your server will not be, be, uh, will not be down. You can see that there are pretty much uh, the standard tier, the basic tier, which is pretty much free of services and is automatically enabled. And then you have the next level is the standard service tier, which add migration capability, turn on, uh, uh, turn it to protect with virtual network resources. This is a this is a pay option. This this is just a quick quick chart. As as I mentioned yesterday, you can find all those charts into docs.azure.com.microsoft.com. Uh, and show you, for example, that when you put the DDoS behind, you will still have all those additional com uh, components on the network. 
Important to remember here that the DDoS is the basic tier, is automatically enabled in Azure. You do not need to do nothing. Uh, actually, it can be one of the questions, let's say, uh, is the basic fear here wh when you need to activate the basic fear, the basic uh, service tier? And the answer is pretty straightforward. You don't need to activate anything because it's automatically updated. While the standard, which is one level up, you need to turn it on and as well pay, pay for it. The second layer of, of uh, network security is around the firewall. As we saw yesterday, for example, the, the web application firewall. And if you remember, I was mentioning that that was uh, around filtering um, not legit request on a web application. OK, let's think about the Azure firewall as something that is. The scope is is a uh, is a uh, bigger because it's not just providing web application firewall, but or even for all the other potential connection, could be FTP, could be could be point to point, could be VPN. Therefore, it's kind of let's call them uh, quote unquote the bigger brother of the web application firewall. So, but it's important to understand the difference between the two because the question on the exam might 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 ask you trickily to which one you should apply in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a specific case. Now, pretty much the the, the firewall is a stateful managed firewall as a services. You have this, uh, firewall as a service means that you do not need physically to uh, you know purchase a hardware, install a software, and do like that. But again, it's just one of the options that. Uh, Azure gives you just by by the, the click of the button. You pretty much put in, pay a uh, put in place a firewall in front of all your um, your 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 cloud implementation, and uh, what it does, it pretty much is apply inbound and outbound starting rules, filtering rules. So you can say that, for example, if you have an application that only uh, a specific uh, office can uh, can access. In the firewall, you will set up the rule that only that specific traffic coming from that that, that, that specific IP can access that application. Therefore, if uh, someone that is uh, somewhere else in the world try to access the application, the firewall will de detect and stop the, the, com the communication. Uh, by definition, it's built in high availability, so you don't need to, to duplicate the firewall around the Azure, your Azure zone, but is is Azure doing that for you? Uh, it can be scalable in a sense, uh, you know, if you need more than one firewall, you can just, you know, it's automatically scale up, scale down. You don't need to take care about that. And also, also is integrated with Azure Monitor Login. So if there is any um, unclear or malicious uh, um, traffic happening, uh, the, that will be automatically seen into the Azure Monitor Login. Okay. Next is uh, the NSG, so the Network Security Group, which is pretty much a way to apply rules to the whole uh, network within within uh, within uh, your cloud implementation or to a subset of, of uh, the, the network. What does it mean? It means that, for example, you can you can apply as, as there is a little you have the little bit of of a screenshot. You can apply, for example, an inbound uh, an inbound security rule and that applied. Mm, so let's think about that on top. You have a firewall. So so into, into the real architecture, we'll have the DDoS on top. Below you will have a firewall, and below the firewall you will have, you will have the NSG. What does it mean that the firewall can allow some traffic to be to be filtered, but then at the at the network you can also set an additional rule that some of the things that goes through the firewall go into a, a security group, and some goes into another security group, and you can do that by creating rules and filtering uh, uh, according to the destination IP address, port, and protocol. I don't know how much familiar you are with networking, but things that you need to rem remember are the IP addresses, port, uh, and different protocols. So, for example, uh, the typical internet uh, port is port 80, SSL port is uh, 443, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the good things about the network security group is that okay, we, even if we have uh, we, uh, segregated some computer within, within subnet, as we have seen yesterday, for example, in this case, the box on the Left is a subnet. This is another subnet. This is another subnet. Subnet one, two, and three. You can still create those rules globally across multiple sub uh, subnet. So it's a way to generate rules and uh, and apply more security. Um, the next concept is application security groups. So the same concept that we have for the network, you can create a security group accordingly to the an application. So in this case, yeah, we have, for example, virtual machine one, two, and three. Uh, the application security group it means that each network card 
will have a specific uh, IP. The network security group, it group those into a logic uh, network, but then, then you want that some only some traffic will go through, for example, uh, virtual machine one, virtual machine two, and you do that through the application security group. So in the case, you can see that if you have, for example, a code that comes from the internet, filter down to your DDoS, to your firewall, and then goes into the security group, and then apply the application security group. So think about like a different tier and actually goes down a bit, bit like we have seen before the layer. So you can ensure that some application can handle only some specific IP address. Uh, and then you can set up rules uh, allowing to focus on only on the business logic of the application. You don't need to take care about uh, the security within your application because that will be extrapolated to the application security group. Um, now, here it kind of summarizes a bit what, what, we, what we have seen before because, uh, you know, when we look looking into the uh, what is the, the right uh, solution for the network, well, you need to understand what is the how you, you secure the perimeter, as it's called, and the case pretty much is done through firewall and the DOS. So you can set the boundary of what can filter within your cloud implementation through the firewall, and then to avoid malicious uh, things that comes in with the DDoS. Then within the cloud implementation, you can segregate it more using the network layer of the network security group or the application security group as well. So here is an example, like for example, you can have uh, two network security group, one or two subnet, one is 10.0.0.0, uh, like 10.1.0.0, therefore, you know, you can segregate them. And so if someone managed to get into this subnet, he might not be able to get into the application subnet net as well. Um, that was uh, about it on the network. Uh, questions so far? Yeah, I've got one question. Mohamed Abadil here. Um, so basically, um, the implementation of, uh, you know, firewall security group and application group also puts a complexity on uh, trying to figure out why a certain connection doesn't work, right? Because you have to see in different uh, places why this IP address is being blocked, for example. Isn't it? Or is there, is there an one management centralized uh, tool where I can see uh, inspects such things? So you, you are right in a, in a way that uh, those are put in place by design. So when you design your cloud implementation, you need to ensure that uh, whoever designed the network components uh, put in place the right rules because, you know, yes, you're right. You might you might get a, an IP, an IP uh, that is blocked, but then maybe it was designed to be like that. So um, the, the answer is that you might be able to get what it, what it, what it is, the, um, uh, the Azure uh, monitor logging, where pretty much you have uh, the result of what has been blocked. Then, of course, you need to do a bit of debug because if you design in that way, the system is supposed to work in that way. Uh, you can you can have, you have tools that allow you to uh, monitor those traffic, and if you need to have an alert of things that is going to be blocked or things that are not going to be blocked, you can do that um, with tools out of the box, such as the monitoring log, or or with as we saw yesterday with uh, the serverless components where you have event driven. Uh, workflow and in the case you can be notified as well. Excellent. Um, yeah. Yeah, Please. I have a question. Um, the firewall and uh, the very first uh, security tool are working by default, right? Uh, the DDoS and the firewall, right? Yes, the DDoS basic service tier work by default. The firewall now is something that you need to put in place yourself because it's one of the services that you activate or, or, or don't activate. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Authentication and authorization. Um, the next step is around security is to define define that what is authentication and what is authorization. It seems to be a silly definition, but the exam actually asks. Ask, uh, I've seen a, a few questions that, that, that are around. Describe what is authentication or describe what is authentication, and then you have one of the four to, to choose. So the authentication is pretty much allow you to define who you are. So how do you do that? 
well, you need to have something that you know, typically a user-based password, something that you have that could be, for example, a two-factor authentication where, where you get an SMS with, with a code that you need to plug in, or something that you are, in the case, might, could be something around the uh, biometrics or, or, or a face recognition and stuff like that. So keep in mind that authentication, it allows you to log in into a system. It allows you to tell to the, to the system who you are. Now, authorization is the next step. So once you have been authenticated, the authorization tells you, what am I allowed to do? So am I allowed to modify an application? Am I allowed to read only certain data? Am I allowed to create a new virtual machine? So those are the, 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 the difference and definition about authentication and, auto and authorization. Um, keep this very, very in mind because there are a few questions on the exam that, uh, that actually say, uh, uh, I've just logged in uh, using blah, blah, blah. Am I using the authentication or the authorization? Something like that. As you can see here, the authorization is pretty much, it means that I'm authorized to uh, access app and resources. Am I, am I authorized or not to see or not see or delete or edit the, de the data? And what is my level of access? Only only uh, certain data or only some application? Can I implement, can I deploy new resources and stuff like that? Now. Going from the definition, you can see that how do we put in place this? This is going to put in place by the Azure Active Directory. So just to make you aware that uh, every time that you log in your Accenture laptop, uh, who is authenticating you is a, is a software called Active Directory. And this Active Directory is, is run centrally or could be even run on a, on a cloud. Now, Azure, even if you do not have your own uh, Active Directory in, in, uh, in your organization, you can uh, Active, Direct, Active Directory, Azure Active Directory is automatically enabled when you sign up within within a, within a, um, Azure. Um, now, the uh, Azure Active Directory is, uh, is, uh, is actually pretty good because it allows you, first of all, the integration with uh, your on-premises. So you can have one single uh, authentication, uh, auto, auto, uh, authentication happening. And and has been used to used to be leverage the permission around the software as a services, the platform as a services, and infrastructure as a services. So pretty much it allows you is the identity management for the application across all the different uh, services that you are uh, using in uh, in, uh, in Azure. It allows you also the integration with a third party, uh, and that's why, for example, if if you can uh, if you can uh, for example if you have already an Active Directory within your own premises, there is a way to um, federate the on premises with Azure, and therefore it's going to be simple and easy to just uh, from, from an experience point of view, where you log in into your computer and automatically you can be autom automatically logging in, log in into Azure as well. Uh, allow you to collaborate with partner through federation. I don't know if you guys have ever um, uh, chat uh, in Teams with someone with, with, which is not in Accenture, and this is due to the fact that there are some uh, connection between the different active directories now it could happen on the on on the cloud with azure or could happen or could happen uh, point by point with uh, with the, the premises but most likely it's going to happen on the cloud um and then uh, pretty much allows you both both way to be integrated with application on the premises and on the cloud now keep in mind keep in mind that active directory when 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 we when we mean uh, authentication is we right away think about user and password. Authentication is not only a physical user, but could be also an application. For example, if you have an application that sits into your data center but requires some information that is into a, an IIS in Azure, that application needs to be authenticated to go through the uh, Azure and then go through the right, right information into the IIS, for example. How do you do that? You do not, typically, you don't uh, create a uh, Application one and password password one two three. If there is a way that with the Active Directory you authenticate the the the, the application through as through tokens, uh, it's kind of a different uh, technology, and then uh, the tokens recognize who which application is requesting what. Therefore, the, the data can flow from cloud to on premises and on premises to cloud as well. Now. This is just for your knowledge. No, no, nobody's ever going to ask you anything, anything like that into the exam, but just so, so that you understand the concept. Now, this is actually a very annoying slide in a sense you have to remember this because sometimes the, the questions say, oh, uh, index active directory B3, basic and premium. 
uh, do I, what is the SLA? And you can see that if you don't remember that it's only the 99.9 is on the basic, you, you are going to fail the exam. So this is one of the few things, on my opinion, that you actually need to just remember. But in a nutshell, the Active Directory are three, three tier. The one is free that you, you get right away when you sign up. So it allows you single sign-on, it allows to password uh, and change for cloud user, security and user report, uh, directory object, uh, user group management, synchronization federation on premises through Active Directory Connect. So this is, for example, the, how you connect your uh, Accenture uh, Active Directory to Accenture in the cloud Active Directory. And those are all components are free. Then you have basic and premium. So basic add those additional components and premium those additional components. Um, P1 and P2 stand for priority one and priority two. So pretty much uh, um, uh, is, is the way that you are you are pretty much, the, so, so those are the premium feature. Uh, so P1 is uh, the, the premium feature one, premium feature two, and that's those apply to the premium. So the, pretty much you have two level of different, of premiums uh, Active Directory. Mm. Uh, to be honest, we could spend the whole hour just talking about those services. The only thing you need to try to remember, skim them through, try to remember. You will find a few questions that we will, will try to ask you, about, for example, which version of Active Directory do I need to have if I want, want to connect with my, my uh, on-premises? In the case, you know that is the AD. Then, you want, then maybe you have a question to talk about what is the SL, uh, if I want to have 99.9% SLA on my Active Directory, which version should I have? You need to remember is the basic. Uh, the premium is uh, again is an additional feature. Uh, my experience, but don't take don't take it as as as, as a written in stone. Uh, I've not seen any question asking you to to tell you if it's premium one or premium two prior, uh, features. But please know what are the features. For example, self service password reset. You cannot do that into the other one. So you need to have this one on the on -pre premium uh, version. I know that it's a bit annoying, but it's one of the few things that you actually need to read and try to remember. Now, don't no, don't think you need to remember each one by one. But there are some, uh, some. Maybe you go through the question and you find and try to remember those one. Perfect. Um, I have a question about that. Yes. Previously, so what are the SLS for the basic one, uh, for the free one, and the premium one? So is a uh, is a uh, is not co uh, is not written on the slide, but let me quickly uh, look it for you. Uh, Zur AD. Those are those are pretty much those are, are the, the 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 summary according to the according to the exam. But it's actually it's a valid it's a valid point. Azure uh, AD SLA. Very, very good question. Oops. One second. Eh? Lay Azura DS Lay. So you just need to go in a in a in Google or Bing or whatever uh, search, and you just type Azure and whatever, and every, every, everything will come up. Um, we guarantee at least 99.9 availability for Azure Directory Basic and Premium services. There are and the other one probably they do not downtime. No, there there it is written. No SLA is there for free. Exactly, exactly. So if it's down, you can't, you can't, you can't complain. <laughs> okay. So, and that's why it's important to understand the, 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 the definition. So, that, but then there is, well, there, there will be a, a session specific to SLA when we are going to touch the SLA. And there are a few SLA that, are, that I will ask you to remember because that's, that's key. But there is a, a session on that. Well, well, actually, that's a very good question. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Okay, uh, Azure, uh, what are the benefits of Azure, Azure Active Directory? So first of all, uh, let's look into quickly this, uh, this, uh, this uh, chart. So first of all, uh, the Azure Active Directory is compatible with all the devices, iOS, macOS, uh, uh, Android, Windows, and, and so forth. 
Um, it protect on-premise web application uh, with secure remote access. So if you have Active, active Directory on-premises and you use uh, applications that are in, uh, in your cloud or, or, or in on-premises, it actually it protects the authentic, it, it authenticate and in Active Directory you can, for example, set up the multi-factor authentication. Therefore, it allows you to authenticate and be se se secure in uh, regardless of it's on-premises or on, or on the cloud. Uh, the option, the, the good, good, the good things is that active, Azure Active Directory extend your existing Active Directory on the cloud. Therefore, think about how to manage user, how to manage policy, how to manage uh, uh, computers, stuff like that can be extended. And then the, the good things is that allow you a single sign-on, so you don't need to sign on on your computer and then sign on into a portal of Azure and stuff like that. But you will just have a seamless integration. So. Pretty much extending the on-premise uh, Active Directory to the Azure Active Directory, it gives you a lot of extra uh, additional things. Of course, you need to be sure that you secure it down. If not, you're just opening a door to a potential potential uh, threat. Now, I, um, I don't know if you've heard, heard have, if you ever heard about the concept of tenants, but in Active Directories, tenants are pretty much uh, a dedicated instance of Azure, Azure, uh, uh, um, Azure uh, Active Directory. What does it mean? If you have, if you are a part of Accenture and then maybe you are um, a part of or, or, uh, a non-profit organization that have another Active Directory or stuff like that, and both have Azure subscription, you cannot cross them, but you will be assigned to a tenant of Accenture and a tenant of uh, the other organization. This allows you pretty much with one single user to be access multiple resources in, in, uh, independently. It's actually very simple for the for the different uh, uh, tenant um, administrator to you know ensure that the right policy are in place because you as a user do not do not don't have any 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 permission until until you join one tenant or the other tenant and then within the tenant the rules will be dictated by the administrator. And also there are independencies. So if you get uh, read only in Accenture tenant and uh, edit permission into another tenant, that does not affect one to each other. So it pretty much the tenant is a way for you to be to belong to different organization and have different permission all independently and all uh, all uh, uh, seamlessly for you because you just need to use one single user. Think if there is no, there wasn't be this option. It means that you should be, you would, you would need to have two user, one for each organization, two or, or n user, one for each organization. Therefore, uh, the management could be very overwhelming, overwhelming from your side. Multi-factor authentication. I'm pretty sure that, as I mentioned before, all of you have used uh, or are using uh, multi-factor authentication. For example, for authorizing authorizing bank uh, transaction. Or even if you log in into your web mail of Accenture for, for, from a laptop which is not your uh, Accenture laptop, you need to fill in an additional code and all those kind of elements. So uh, this is important to in understand that this is key for you to increase the um, the security uh, of your of your uh, of your uh, auto out authentication. Um, you can see that, for example, you can use so by default. If you install, uh, uh, if you do an application within uh, within Azure, it's not activated. But then, when you when you when you get things such as uh, uh, software as a services, software as a services, for example, uh, Office uh, Microsoft 365 business, this is automatically put in place. Of course, also the multi-factor authentication is automatically put if you subscribe to the Active Directory Premium or for Active Directory Free plus Office 365 or uh, Azure Active Directory Global Administrator. This is just enforced by, 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 by design. So for the multi-factor authentication, please keep in mind those three bullet points uh, because those are things that uh, I've seen popping up on the exam question. So in summary, multi-factor authentication allow, allow an extra layer of security where it's not just user password, but it's user password plus a code which is typically variable by 30 seconds or 10 seconds or whatever is the the the, the fact the multi-factor authentication uh, protocol that you are using could be an SMS, could be the uh, uh, Microsoft Authenticator, uh, could be multiple option. And then wh where where does it, this come from? Well, if you have a, a, a Active Directory Premium, is automatically enabled. 
or if you have Microsoft 365 business, is automatically enabled. Then if you have ID3 plus Office 365, uh, any, any Office 365 license is enabled. Or if you are a global uh, an, uh, AD administrator, that is enabled. In this case, it, it, it's uh, pretty much come uh, as mandatory. Security Center. Security Center is pretty much a page within Azure that allow you to review where there are security issues. Uh, it's pretty much is a is a is a is a machine learning type of of a service where the spider around your services, the spider around your virtual machine, and the spider around all your storage, and they kind of come up with you with a report that give you some some issue. For example, you can see that uh, you might have issue with. Uh, um, not having set up the, the firewall, uh, maybe it's telling you that the operation system is not updated with, with updated patches, uh, maybe it's telling you that the um, disks are not encrypted, or that someone has tried a brute force attack. A brute force attack is pretty much when someone is pretty much trying to guess your password, but you know, an incremental way, just trying, 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 and the code, therefore the, the, the server will see a lot of requests coming from the same IP with uh, just changing a password, and that is pretty much can be identified as a brute force attack. Uh, again, another attack would be a remote desktop protocol, when someone tried to remote desktop into your, your, uh, your machine and uh, continuously fail to uh, insert the, the, the password. So this is actually a good way for you to Take an eye on uh, what can be potentially a problem with internal security, uh, and and is uh, pretty much built in and given for you for free. To keep in mind is that this is not the only way that you can mm, ensure security because this is built on machine learning. Therefore, if there is some something completely new or a, an attack that is not being uh, accounted before, it might not show up here. So do not rely on this to to design the security. You need to actually have security expert to design that. Key Vault. Um, the Key Vault is a service that Azure provide you, and is a service where pretty much you are going to store uh, credentials, you store encrypted encryption key, certificates, server side tokens. So instead of you remembering all those components, you can store it into a central location, which is called Key Vault, uh, and therefore it's uh, it's secure by definition. Now. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, these, these pretty much services is allow you, for example, if you have an application that need to call uh, uh, a data, a database, and the, con the connection need to go through a seven size token instead of you to R code the token into the the API, you actually can put the the token into the key vault. Therefore, you increase the security because if someone access your co code, it will see the token and can reuse it for malicious purposes. Instead, if you put it in the key vault. The, the 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 hacker will need to access your accent your your uh, Azure uh, subscription and then go within the keyboard services and then access the keyboard services as well, which is pretty much a uh, you increase the level of difficulty for a potential hacker to um, to 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 do, do, do to do malicious things. Um, Pretty much, is key vault uh, is a collection of encrypt and cri cryptographic uh, keys and cryptographically protected data called secret. And those secrets are pretty much accessible through different way, through code or through the CLI, the, uh, uh, as we see yesterday. So there is a different way where you can retrieve those things. You can retrieve them manually, or you can make them retrieved by a code, and that's how you should you should do this as a best practice. Now, how do we? Uh, tied all together. Uh, well, let's say that, that there is a service called Azure Sentinel, and what it does that detects data incidents from uh, connected source sources, and pretty much is a kind of uh, monitoring system that allows you to see if there is an issue with the data. Um, the, the good things about these services is that pretty much is a, is a uh, it has connector with a lot of different uh, data sources, and it kind of give you an idea of what what can be wrong? Uh, it uh, pretty much is it detect uh, threat. It gives you alerts, and pretty much you can pretty much um, be fast respond to when there is an incident. The good things is about this one is that because it is a, is a, is a service that pretty much put together all those sub services like 
store data, automation, user interface, rules, uh, machine learning, uh, search investigation. Uh, it's something that, again, has all the, almost all the paths, you can put them together yourself, but because it's already there, you, you can just, by, by click on the button, you can just fire off understanding. Um, now, the last component, uh, one of the last components of, now, as of now, we have talked about, all we're talking about is pretty much um, talking about how we secure application, how we secure server, how we secure uh, network, uh, uh, how we secure password uh, encryption, and how we, we know who is accessing what through the Active Directory, to the, the concept of authentication, authorization, and stuff like that. Now, sometimes an organization do not want to, uh, to have their application mixed with other clients' work uh, workload. What does it mean? It means that when you pretty much go into Azure and you start a virtual machine, potentially your virtual machine sits into a physical server where the same server is, is serving other clients. So potentially your virtual machine is mixed with other clients' virtual machine. Now, if you do not want that to happen, Azure give you the option to have a, a dedicated host. What does it mean? You pretty much pay more, of course, but then you say to Azure, I want that server to be completely dedicated to myself. What does it mean? It means that everything in the server will only be belong to you. So uh, you, of course, in the case you need to pay more. And that is pretty much for, um, uh, it, it pretty much goes down to, maybe enhancing security because if someone access the server, uh, the physical server can access to your data as well. So um, you kind of uh, pretty much segregate the infrastructure and uh, pretty much you can, you can you know in advance the, the, the number of, of server, the, of the processor, the, the, the virtual machine that you're going to put there and all those kind of things. So those are um, pretty much a bit, a bit uh, going be about going back from a cloud concept, but it Azure allow you to do so because they realize that some customer want to have their own bare metal server where they can run whatever they want. Uh, Azure Information Protection. Uh, pretty sure that you have seen many times this little banner popping up into your Word document uh, stuff like that. So this this is a little banner that uh, is an Azure service that allow you to put in place some. Uh, um, information rights uh, on your doc documents, Word, Excel, and so on and so forth. So pretty much what's happened is that you can uh, put labels uh, into documents and email where where you can uh, you can pretty much set up the confidentiality of each files. And uh, therefore, for example, you, you, ca you cannot forward the documents, you cannot print the documents and stuff like that. And this is done through these little services called Azure Information Protection. Here yeah, there's a note that says, do not confuse the, the Azure Advanced Threat Protection, which detects knows malicious attack. So the information protection is around giving the right uh, tagging to documents or emails so that uh, people can only do what you want. They can edit, they cannot forward, they can print, they cannot print and stuff like that. While the Azure Advanced Threat Protection instead is more of a security that allow you to identify if someone is trying to hack your system. So please, please be sure. Regal both saying the word protection. Please don't uh, um, confuse them. Azure policy. So what are the Azure policy? The Azure policy are those um, fancy little rules that you can apply to different uh, component uh, where you pretty much assign uh, permission to resources. Now, resources could be a user, resources could be a virtual machine, resources could be a storage. Anything in, a, in, a, in Azure is, is, a, is a resource. So with a, with a policy, you can pretty much ensure that uh, things are being deployed as you want, things are being migrated as you want, or th uh, things are being created as you want. To create a policy, pretty much you need to go through to those three steps. The number one is going to create a policy definition where you pretty much you set up the policy. To set up a policy, you have a little a little script that you need to know the language, where you put, for example, the the the, uh, the resource IDs uh, and what they can do if it's read-only, edit, delete, and stuff like that. Then you assign the definition to a set of resources, and in the case, it could be as easy as assigned to the 
resource group. As we mentioned yesterday, there is a concept of resource group where you bundle up a lot of different resources. And then pretty much you run the policy and you see and review the, the, the result. Why? Because maybe your policy is too restrictive and therefore you can maybe you don't allow data to be transferred if that's the case and stuff like that. Uh, then there is a concept of initiative. An initiative is pretty much as a collection of policies. And then you start the, the collection of policies to a, uh, to a multiple uh, to, to, to a multiple resources and stuff like that. So one single policy is a one rule. Multiple rules can be grouped into initiatives, and that can be easy for you to manage and also deploy the policies as well. Now, you will hear on the exam how a concept of RBAC, which is role-based access, access control, which is pretty much going back to the authentication, authentication authorization. Once you're logged in, what can you do? What you can do, what, what the role-based access control tells you you can do. So through the access control, what you're going to do, you are pretty much define, designing and defining what each one of the resources or group of resources, to make it simple, can perform in terms of read, edit, and stuff like that. You can see that here you have the, again, is the is a fine grain access management for the Azure resources, enabling you to grant user a specific right they need to perform their job. So you have Active Directory, then you have a, a user, an application, a user group. This is pretty much into your on-premises. Then this extend to the uh, to the Azure into resource groups, subscription, and stuff like that. Now here is not mentioned, but the role-based authentication uh, uh, control can go below the resource group as well. Now, what, how do you implement the, the R, RBAC? So you have a scope, which is the subscription, the resource group, or each individual resources. And what you do as a role, you give them a role as a reader, a resource-specific or custom role, in the sense some of them might be readers, some of them might be contributors, some of them might be owners. Uh, you actually give a role of contributors to who can um, edit um, some of the of some of the parameters, some of the contents, or some of the some of the resources. And the owner instead is who is the uh, creator of those. Uh, resources. What is important to understand, do not confuse the owner with the administrator. So you can be an administrator, it means that you have superpower, let's call it like that, quote unquote, uh, on the Azure portal. In a sense, you can create role, you create, uh, you, you, can, you can create subscription, you can uh, connect to subscription, you can create a resource group, you can create pretty much everything that you want. But then you don't need to be an administrator to be an owner. So you can be an owner of some of the resources that was created by an administrator, if it makes sense. Again, here it's important to understand the concept of uh, RBAC because uh, a few of the questions may ask that. And they say that and they will ask you, for example, if you want that your, uh, your user can, all, can, uh, can, you know, can modify, you sh you can modify a VMs, uh, should it be a reader, a contributor, or an owner? The case should be a contributor because we are talking about only modify and not owning. Therefore, you can, with the ownership, you can delete, uh, you can add, uh, and do things that uh, the contributor cannot perform. Resource lock. Um, the resource lock is actually an extra le le level of, uh, of compliance slash security where each one of the resources or or at the at the group level you you allow you pretty much lock the deletion or you lock the uh, being read only that doesn't mean that you need to be an administrator to delete it means that if you try to delete you will get a pop a pop up they say uh like this one uh, you fail to delete the virtual machine uh, because uh, pretty much there is a lock in place if you have the right permission, if you are, for example, an owner, you can override this one, but you need to physically click on remove the lock, delete, and stuff like that. Therefore, they give you a, from one side, they give you peace of mind that you're not deleting things randomly because it stops you before you do so. Second, it also, it, it also when, when and if you want to delete, you can do that, but you still need to have the right permission to do that. See, similar for read only. Uh, read only will allow uh, read activity to be performed against it blocking any modification or deletion of the resources. So you have two levels of the block, of the lock, sorry. 
Uh, resource log can be performed by the subscription, resource, uh, and division resources. Again, uh, these are always come across as the, the, the layer or the hierarchy that you need to remember and consider. So if someone in the exam say, I have uh, a subscription which is a uh, um, lock on deletion, um, can a user delete uh, with, no, with no alert uh, a virtual machine? The answer is no, because it cascades down. Um, Blueprints. I think we are the last topic and uh, today, for, oh, wow, today we are actually on time. Blueprints is a way that you can go into uh, Azure Docs, uh, uh, Microsoft Docs, and you can pretty much download best practice of uh, Azure implementation. Because as you might understand by now, when you when we talk about cloud, the first thing that we keep in the tops in our minds is virtual machine and eventually a database. In reality, you have those additional services that we tried to discuss in the last couple of days, where we have network configuration, network components such as the DOS uh, um, um, firewalls, uh, then we have uh, application load balancer, then we have uh, uh, ne um, network security group, uh, then we have maybe some platform as a services, some uh, application as a services, and everything tied up into our cloud design. Now, <laughs> It can be very overwhelming for you, for, uh, for us to just understand how to put all together, especially if you are not like a really expert or, or into, into the Azure. And for this, pretty much what, uh, um, uh, what it does for you, it gives you uh, a package of what each blueprint, according to if you are trying to develop like, I don't know, an artificial intelligence, intelligent implementation or uh, artificial or no no um, a bot uh, a chat bot or stuff like that most likely you go there if you find a blueprint that will be job done for you because you already know what are the components and uh, also it can become uh, like, like the definition say here it give you all the components and all the standard that you need to, to that you need to put together to put to realize that that to complete that uh, that single project or 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 uh, or implementation um it's good that because uh, pretty much what it does it uh, not only it give you it give you the guidelines but actually as you can see here you have a, 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 all, uh, a lot of artifacts therefore think about this as, a, as a, your guidance to go and implement the, the cloud uh, the guidance for example the, the artifacts for example here they say mention is like a, there's a role assignment so to who you should assign the different roles policy assignments uh, as uh, RIM temp templates, the RIM templates pretty much is a, a template that have all the different services, as you mentioned before, it could be a VM, a database, storage, uh, firewall, and do give you a template for you to easily deploy them into Azure. And then also uh, allow you to manage the resource group. So use the, the blueprint. What you need to remember for the exam is that exists a concept of blueprint where it, it, it uh, accelerates the implementation of cloud services according, according to different uh, topic. And it's composed by multiple artifacts, of which probably the most important are those four.